Zootopia was changed very late into development, loads of things were cut out, and there was a much darker and much more negative story. Nick was the main characters, predators had to wear collars, and the collars would shock them if they moved too fast or did anything too major, because the prey thought that they may attack them if they get too excited or something like that. But with them scrapping all of that late into the development, it left a whole story that was left untold for Zootopia, and is one that I'm going to try and retell today from all the behind the scenes stuff. And yeah, around 90% of this stuff is going to be actual behind the scenes stuff, and some of it's kind of filler to kind of join all of the bits together, so if you want to see the actual raw behind the scenes stuff, then look in the description because I've put all of it down there. This is the original story of Zootopia. The story starts off in a jungle one day, a young leopard creeps up to a deer and he gets closer and closer until the deer sees him, it's too late, when all of a sudden he jumps up at the deer before the camera pulls back. Blood, blood, blood and, death. and we realise they're not actually in a jungle or the Carrot Days Festival for that matter, they're actually in Woodland Elementary, a world where Predator and Prey live side by side in peace, and they're actually just practicing for a play where they show their old ways. And as they finish practicing and some other animals come up, a beaver, a raccoon, a squirrel and a rabbit, the beaver wants to work with wood, the raccoon wants to drive a trash truck, the squirrel says that she wants to sell nuts, and the rabbit hesitates. She doesn't like the song and doesn't want to grow carrots when she's older. I don't want to grow carrots. Oh, what is your problem? Everyone sighs and leaves for a break while the armadillo teacher tells Judy, the rabbit, about her dreams. When I was your age, I wanted to be a firefighter. But she never went after her dreams because armadillos would bowl up when they sense any sort of danger. And she says that certain mammals can only do certain things and that Judy would only really be able to grow carrots and do that for a living. But then all of a sudden a kid comes in, talking hysterically and stops the conversation, saying that a cat kid is stuck up the tree. When they get outside, the branch that the kid is on starts to break while everyone panics and the armadillo teacher rolls up into a ball. And then Judy notices a laser pointer on the armadillo teacher and points a laser at the tree, which the cat can't help but follow. Judy guides him down the tree as the police arrive. They commend Judy and give her a police badge sticker. Well, Judy Hops, you are a hero. And they tell her that she'd make a great cop one day, much to the amusement of her classmates who thought that was absolute nonsense. While this was going on, in Zootopia, young fox Nick and his dad were pitching a suit tailor shop, and no one was willing to invest in their idea. Nick got to see just how hard and cruel sometimes Zootopia is. But that didn't stop Nick. Many years later, he tried to launch his own business, an indoor arcade with rides and games of all sorts. He was determined and asked everyone that he could. And in the process, he managed to hurt his neck. So he took a break and he had a checkup where the doctor hesitantly removed his collar and Nick finally felt free for a bit. He felt like he could now run in fields, go on roller coasters, and get all excited without getting shocked. But then, all of a sudden, click, the collar was back on. Nick sure hated Zootopia. He felt very much like it was a police state that was oppressive to predators and was simply giving a good fun and teaching his young that it was amazing. But still, he went back to asking investors to invest in him and after many more days, he finally was given an investment by a polar bear who owned a restaurant called Kuzlov's Place, which was actually just a front for some of the polar bear's shady operations that he was doing, some dodgy illegal stuff. And unfortunately, Nick greatly underestimated the cost of such a large project, so after a few months, he realised that he'd ran out of money and couldn't pay the polar bear back, which made the bear incredibly angry, and he told him to just leave and never bother him ever again. 
So Nick was forced to move into a regular job, working at a fast food joint, Chez Cheese. He met a Finnick who took the drive through orders, while Nick cleaned the cheese filters. And there was actually another familiar face here, Clawhauser, who was the delivery cheater. Nick's hatred for the city continued to grow and grow, and he couldn't stand working at the food joint anymore. So he and Finnick, who were close friends, left and started working together to make money on the streets, convincing people to buy giant ice lollies for them and melting them down and refreezing them to sell them to hamsters. And at the end of the day, they'd almost always head over to Bug Burger, a fast food place that sells food and drink made of insects. Which may sound disgusting, but the predators only had a little choice of food to eat for protein. They couldn't eat their usual prey. And the pair didn't usually care much for keeping the city clean, so they'd often just drop their food boxes around the town. And at the same time, Judy was all grown up and was moving over to Zootopia. She loved Zootopia and was so excited to live her new life as a police officer. Her family didn't expect it to last. But her first impressions were great. When she got there, she was greeted by Assistant Mayor Bellwether, who greeted all new police recruits. She showed them around the National History Museum, and Bellwether told Judy the history of Zootopia, about how predators and prey declared peace around a watering hole, which were now represented by the fountains in the city. She also warned Judy about a bar called Cloven Hoof, which was in a dangerous part of the town and was where bad sheep hung out. And after her introduction, much to her surprise, she was in the police force, that was it. Judy was so excited to be in, even if she did have to be a meter maid. She made the most of her job though, zipping from car to car, issuing tickets left, right and centre, much to the distaste of the city's resident. That was 30 seconds over! But a fellow meter maid go helped her along the way and kept encouraging her. But even with that encouragement, she knew that she couldn't keep doing this forever, and after being exhausted, she went to take a break at the local ice cream parlour where she saw that even the junior sizes of ice cream were massive. Yowzers! <gasps> because this ice cream parlour was made for elephants. At the front of the line, there was a bright red adult fox and a cute baby fox. Nick the adult fox said that the baby fox was somebody that he adopted. An orphan? Uh, he was, officer. He sure was, but 30 minutes ago, I went ahead and made the best decision of my life. Yeah. I'm a dad. And had pigidomi apathy, which he claimed to mean that the baby fox thought he was an elephant. He said that he was his dad and that it was the baby's birthday, while the elephant shopkeeper still refused to sell the fox the jumbo pop. But eventually, after Nick insisting, he accepted and Nick realised that he forgot his wallet. So Judy jumped in and asked if he could get it for free. He said no, obviously. And Nick agreed and cuddled the baby fox before adding that he was blind. Who was blind? But then, boom, Judy pulled out the cash, feeling so sorry for Nick and the baby. But little did Judy know that this was all part of Nick's scheme. He didn't have a baby. The baby fox was simply a fennec fox who, by nature, was small. Both of them worked together to take the jumbo pops, melt them down, and turn them into smaller ice lollies to give to the hamsters. And when Judy found out, she was furious. She, she chased after Nick before he made fun of her and then led her into some wet cement. Judy's first day in the job was horrible. She was also incredibly homesick and was not used to everything being so huge. And she also wasn't used to getting squashed between animals on her way home. But the hardships didn't even stop when she got home. She discovered just how small the ready meals are and how everything was just going wrong in her life so far. She wanted to call home, holding her phone up ready to call her mum, but she puts it down on the table, thinking that she had to be strong and get through her hardships herself. But no, she realised that she accidentally dialed her mum. They were so happy to see her when they answered. Judy pretended that everything was great and that she was having a great time. Luckily, she'd taken off her meter maid outfit so her family couldn't make fun of her for not being a real officer. She didn't need any of that after the day that she'd had. After she finished talking to them, she just collapsed in bed and she hugged her bunny teddy, which had the police badge sticker on it that she'd gotten as a kid all those years ago. After going to sleep, the next day came around and Judy went into work miserable knowing that she'd have to be a meter maid all over again. 
But on the job, she saw something out of the corner of her eye, a robbery. She ran after the robber, pulling off her meter maid outfit and revealing the officer uniform underneath. She ran through the city and leaped into a city of Arctic shrews, causing mayhem in the process. Chief Bogo, who led the police force, wasn't happy. Just as he was about to say that Judy was fired, an otter came in, saying that her husband had gone missing. Judy jumped at the opportunity, and when the word got out that she was taking the case, the chief had no choice. He gave her 48 hours to find the otter, or she was fired. Judy got straight to work trying to find evidence. She jumped up to an elephant's iMac, jumping on all the keys to type, before finding a sighting of him on CCTV, but right there with him was Nick, selling him an ice lolly. Oh. No, not that far. Judy sighs and realizes that they'll have to team up because he knows where he might have gone. After teaming up, they both arrive at the Palm Hotel, which literally looks like a palm tree, and they go in and start looking around for the otter. Along the way, they run into a taming party but keep out of sight. Judy was so excited she'd never seen a taming party before, especially since it had gotten to the exciting part of the party, the part where the polar bear father reaches down and puts the taming collar onto his son. As the father reached down he hesitated before clicking it into place. His son jumped for joy but then zap, it shocked him. Nick looked away sad at the sight of seeing another predator losing his freedom. He wanted to just get up and leave, so they eventually left and found the lift that went to the second highest floor, the floor that was right underneath Gazelle's penthouse, the room where Nick thought the otter would have been taken. They slammed through Kaslo, the polar bear's room, but it was a trap. A ram was in there waiting for them. They sped out of the floor's balcony while the ram charged at them and hit through the balcony barriers. Judy fell back just as Nick grabbed her hand and pulled her back in, saving her life, while the ram fell down to his death. Back in the room, they found the otter tied up and shaken. They brought him back to the chief, hoping that he wouldn't know that the ram incident was related to them. Luckily, it was classed off as him slipping off the balcony, and in response for saving his life, the otter kept the secret to himself. After a hard day's work, they both made their way back to Judy's house, and as she opened the door, she jumped back as her family shouted, Surprise! before screaming at the sight of Nick, who waved at them. <laughs> Judy then calmed them down by saying that he was her friend. His father still isn't happy though, he wants to take her home, before Nick steps in saying that she's doing great, and saying that he won't hurt anybody. They agreed to let her stay and they all head off to a restaurant for dinner where they give Judy a ticket to Gazelle's Zootenio Stadium concert for the next day. The next day, Judy and Nick head off to the concert with Nick splitting up to buy his own ticket before meeting back at the other end. The concert is going all well, they're all having a great when all of a sudden a polar bear appears on stage with a weird looking gun. Judy runs to the front and jumps on the stage holding her hands up, while Nick comes behind the polar bear and pulls the gun out of his hand, smashing it to the floor and jumping out of the way as the weird purple liquid starts spilling out. Sensing that the danger's gone, the tiger backup dancers and Gazelle come back on stage and thank Judy for saving them, telling them that the liquid would have made the tigers go savage. The liquids were outlawed as soon as it was first made and they knew the effect it would have. When they all got back from the concert, they were congratulated by the police force for their bravery, and Nick surprised Judy by also turning up in a police outfit too, announcing that he was in fact going to be an officer too, and they both took their place as police officers. And to celebrate, Gazelle invited them back to a concert a few days later at the Savannah Central, where Gazelle sings Try Everything in honour of Judy, who was the first ever rabbit officer. And yeah, that's it, that's my story. As I said before, pretty much all of these are actual things that were deleted scenes or things that they just changed throughout the development process. To see which things were the actual deleted scenes and which were the things that I added in, be sure to look in the description down below because I put it all down there. But yeah, I hope you found this interesting. I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, I hope you all have a great day. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.